Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode of Noon. I'm absolutely thrilled to have my friend Jessica joining us. She has a diverse nursing background, including trauma, flight, and her current role as a school nurse, which should bring a captivating dimension to this episode. Today, we'll delve into a letter Jessica wrote in 2019 titled, My ER Exit Letter, which went viral on Facebook. This letter resonated with countless readers shedding light on staffing issues and safety concerns for both staff and patients. I'm eager to explore Jessica's experiences and insights. Despite her quiet demeanor, Jessica's passion for medicine and nursing runs deep, making her perspectives all the more fascinating. Our conversation will be a mix of lighthearted stories and profound experiences that will undoubtedly keep you engaged throughout. Get ready for an enticing and thought-provoking discussion. Let's get started. All right. Welcome, Jessica, to the 911 Nonsense Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it so much. Can you go ahead and give me an introduction of yourself? Yes, my name is Jessica Nandino, and I am a wife, a mom of three kiddos. I used to be a ER trauma flight nurse for a good part of my my life, and then recently uh, became a school nurse. Wow, sounds like you've had a hectic life. Three kids on it in itself is a lot to yeah. take care of. It is. How are how old are they? Um, our oldest are twins. They're 10. Oh. They just celebrated their 10th birthday. Boys, girls? Wow, well, one boy and one girl. Oh, perfect. I know. And then our youngest, he is about to celebrate his seventh birthday. Oh so my goodness. I feel old. Twins <laughs> especially, I think, double that hecticness, right? It does. But also, before we had our third kiddo, I had the like, like, thought, Oh, what's one more? And I was so wrong. <laughs> so I don't know if it's <laughs> so wrong. I don't know if it's double the work. Um, yeah, they always kind of the twins play good cop, bad cop, which is nice. They they balance each other out. I kind of feel like someone took my personality and put it into he, like two separate humans, which I don't know how it's going to work out for them. <laughs> But That's yes, fantastic. It, it keeps it interesting. That <laughs> sounds interesting. Oh, I don't have kids myself, but I couldn't imagine having kids and doing the work that that we do. Yeah, it's it's wild actually reflecting back on some of this and and I was just like, what was I thinking or doing or how did I do that? Um yeah, like at the time when I when I flew, you know, I had two kiddos that were not not quite three, and I was pregnant with my third. My goodness. Just, <laughs> no wonder I was tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. So did you start out in the ER? I did. Um, so I grew up in Colorado, and I worked for, well, when I was in school there, I my degree was in psychology and Spanish, and I ended up getting like an externship at the university up there and worked actually for the Department of Psychiatry doing research like a research assistant. And that was kind of my introduction to to emergency services because um, sometimes we would have to meet our research participants if they were hospitalized. So I think it was the first time I worked, like walked into the, the general hospital in downtown Denver. And I was just like, yes, like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was it. I was sold. <laughs> um, yeah. So I did that for a couple of years and, and, kind of identified that my mind I loved how my mind worked in those acute settings you know it was like like so many people I've heard you interview on the podcast like so many of us had undiagnosed or later diagnosed ADHD and um (laughs) so I just I remember really loving my mind worked how I wish it worked all the time in those in those acute acute settings right sure and that's such a huge jump right but you have a really cool unique perspective because a lot of what we do and what we see in the er and in the field these days is mental health related Mm -hmm. right and does that kind of drive you nuts like i for me i feel like what is the solution yeah yeah i i definitely when i was working in the emergency room it was just it's frustrating you feel like you're just you're not fixing anything if anything you're just putting a band-aid on the right on the self-destructive behavior and you're sedating it long enough to get them discharged and then you're not you're not fixing anything no and how hard it is to get 
um, patients admitted to some sort of uh, inpatient treatment. I mean, it almost takes an act of God, you know? Right. Well, and a few years ago, we closed down so many mm-hmm. mental health facilities because we didn't have the staff to support them and exactly. because of the financial burden that it was on the state, though it's a completely necessary service. Mm-hmm. And I think they're starting to see that now. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. I mean, the hospital that I worked at um, the next state over, you know, I'd found out a couple years ago that they were actually shutting down their acute inpatient psych unit, which was, it's just like, how can you feasibly why? do that? How do you right. do that? You know? <laughs> Um, but I believe it, you know, coming to New Mexico um, and going to nursing school. And then I worked in a smaller um, community hospital in like the northern part of the state is where I started. And man, sometimes we would hold patients for, for 48, 72 hours just waiting to get them a bed. Right. You know, and a lot of times it was the next state over, you know. It's, so I am thankful for the mental health field because it, it kind of brought me to emergency medicine. But I, I do think there's such a room for improvement it's just the broken system the original broken system yes. right <laughs> yeah, the original so. yes the, the you the know OG. <laughs> for real and then speaking of like lack of staff you know i think that if the er's could have closed or if they were going to close it would be because of lack of staff mm-hmm. you know we just so short staffed in all the er's and this is a a nationwide yeah issue. it's everywhere um and, you know, it's people like me that are contributing to it as well. I mean, I love, I, I do feel like this is a calling. Um, and we all have our reasons that we end up doing this this um, very bizarre job. But I, I, I do miss it. You know, I would be back there if I felt like I could continue to work there in a safe way for myself, for my license, for my patients, and continue to make change, you know? Yeah. And do so. you, do you mind elaborating on what you felt wasn't safe? Ooh, there was a lot of things. I, um, I think ultimately what came down to it was, you know, I had, I had gone straight to answer your question. I had gone straight into the emergency room as a new grad because I'm stubborn like that. Even though people told me like, you can't do that. Shoot for the stars, right? right? Why not? <laughs> so I talked myself into that. And, um, the only reason I was, I made it was because I just was surrounded by so much experience you know hundreds of years of experience and nurses that had time and were able to care and and bring up like the next generation of nurses and yeah without them it would have been impossible to make that jump and then let alone become a a decent ER nurse so you know when I look back and I had so many situations where I was like I had no idea what I was doing and that could have gone so south But the thing I did have, and I knew I had at the time, was I had someone who knew what they were doing looking over me. They would let me get in a situation that was like uncomfortable for me, right? But not unsafe for the patient. And I kind of want to, I kind of want to elaborate that on a a little bit further and I'm going to explain why. So working pre-hospital, right, as a Mm -hmm. paramedic, a lot of us have the thought, well, nurses just take orders. Mm -hmm. So... It, seeing that from this side, and we do have a lot of EMTs and paramedics and you know EMS workers in general, how are you putting yourself in an uncomfortable position? Well, I think nowadays that's how you are a nurse. You just take orders. That's the only sustainable way to do it. How I was trained and and like the, and the culture that I grew up in is like you were a bad nurse if all you did was just take quarters. You know, there was a lot, there was so much critical thinking pushed when I was new to the ER. And a lot of that was by the nurse educator at the hospital I first started at, by the preceptors. But ultimately, like I took that upon myself, right? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, the whole saying to air is human, like doctors will make mistakes, they do, Uh, we all do because we're human and it takes takes a village it takes a team you know to do what's right by that patient so how i was trained was certainly not to take just take orders it was to anticipate orders it was to question orders that didn't make sense to um if it if something didn't make sense to seek out the why behind it because it would make you a better better uh, er nurse so i don't know i've never worked in an inpatient floor so i think my percept perception of it is completely skewed but yeah I guess when I came into the profession just taking orders was was not 
yeah, it was it was not what we were taught. Yeah, no, and I don't think that your perception necessarily is skewed. It sounds like your perspective may be different, and that's because mm-hmm. you're advocating for those patients, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it's easy to assume that while they're in the hospital, the doctor has eyes on them 24-7, mm-hmm. and that's not true. The doctors walk in, they do an assessment, mm-hmm. and then they write labs or orders or whatever based on those assessments. But you're actually going in and you're keeping a watchful eye on those patients. So you're seeing any acute changes. You're seeing anything that that doctor may not have been, may not have seen at the time that they did their assessment. So you're getting to help kind of make those decisions. Well, hey, you wrote this lab for a blood thinner, but this patient's now having stroke symptoms Mm -hmm. and could potentially have a bleed. So let's maybe stop that and do a CT scan. Yeah. And I just, I mean, I think in our I, having also worked later in my career in pre-hospital, I saw, I just felt like a lot of camaraderie with pre-hospital. I mean, it's a completely different world, and I <laughs> felt, you know, I never felt in my element. I mean, so much respect to you guys, because, um, and I have more stories about that. But yeah, I just, I don't know. I've always just been one of those people that's like, why? But why? Why are we doing this? And also, I think it's, it, it's for the patient. It's also for you as a provider, because nothing's more annoying than going in and drawing labs and then having a doc say, oh, also, can you get a pneumonia or something? And you're like, oh, I was, you know. Yeah, you already poked this patient. Now you're asking me to poke them again. Exactly. Yeah. So it's that just proactive thinking and proactive action and more collaboration, being more of a collaborative member of the team as opposed to just someone who is reacting to orders that I loved so much about the ER. Also, you know, my first job was in a, it was a level three. They may have been gotten level two certified. And I worked night shift and man, like middle of the night, there was one physician on. So there was multiple times where, you know, you have two traumas because maybe we wouldn't keep them. We would send them to the trauma center. If the resources were available. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So yes, oftentimes they'd be flying out, but ultimately that like primary stabilization was on you. And very quickly I realized like, yeah, the doctor won't always be there. No. Right? Yeah, yeah you don't always have somebody there to yeah. kind of guide you. Yeah, and so I've always felt this this deep responsibility. And again, with respect to my scope, I mean, I, I know I've also seen, and we've all worked with people that, that work way outside of their scope. Right. And you can get, in a, you know, that's a dangerous you place to be. Lose your license over that. Exactly. Yeah. But but just to be all just cognizant and kind of thinking forward, throwing ideas out there, I think you're in this job long enough, you, oh, you, you're part of, you'll see something where the tech calls out some idea from, from the hallway, and oh my god, they're right. Check glucose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's oh, their yeah. K? Oh, yeah. and somehow, <laughs> every, you know, the physicians, the nurses, all these years of, you know, whatever, formal education missed the obvious. Yeah, the total right? vision. Totally. Um, so I've always been a huge advocate of you see something, you say something. Sure. Um, I'm sure you carried that into the flight world with you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And and it's funny because I was such, growing up, I was just a painfully shy kid uh, well into my 20s. Really? Yeah. And I think <laughs> that probably surprises a couple people. It, it definitely <laughs> does. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, you know, I had some anxiety. <laughs> still do. No, but um, I remember this clinical educator that took me on as a new grad, always stressed, like, you see something, you say something. He's like, at the, you know, at the very worst, you're, you're going to, it's your ego. You're going to embarrass yourself, right? right? Cool. What does, what matters, your ego or the, the patient surviving? Second, you know, cool, you embarrass yourself, but like you identify a gap in your knowledge base. So you become better. You know, you got that moment of like, oh my God, I'm an idiot. Yeah, it's okay to be embarrassed. Right. Um, And then the third is, is, you know, the third kind of outcome is, yeah, and you actually might say something and notice something that no one else does, and you save that person's life. So yeah, I've always been a big proponent for speaking out. And, you know, the pendulum swing, maybe because I was such a quiet, reserved kid, maybe I'm swinging too far in the other direction. (laughs) I I don't think you're swinging too far in the other direction. I think you're standing up for what's right. And you know, you talk very passionately about your years of service in the ER, mm-hmm. and that's great because you see so many grumpy people right now mm-hmm. that are just like, fuck this, fuck that, yeah. this, is, this is bullshit, why are we doing this, you know? 
Yeah, and I do think that's eventually part of the reason I ended up. I was like, I need to step away because I didn't like the person I was becoming. I didn't like the provider I was becoming. But would you say that that was because of the situations that you were being put in? Well, so, you know, I've been a nurse for almost 15 years now. And so in that time frame, I, I can see that where we would, you know, okay, now first we're going to get rid of the secretary in your pod. There's just going to be one secretary for the unit. Now we're going to get rid of the tech in your pod, and there's going to be two techs for three pods, right? Just this kind of skimming, skimming, skimming. And then it's minor change that's uncomfortable, but no one's going to, you know, go to bat. What do you mean you took one secretary away? Yeah. So it's this slow kind of skimming. It's like the frog in the pot. That, like, they're turning up the water, and, and you don't notice. And just getting to the point where when I did leave the, the trauma center, suddenly it was like, we're supposed to answer the phone, just the general ER phone. So every patient or whoever is calling, uh, we're supposed to put together transfer paperwork. We're supposed to, you know, assist with records requests, right? And it's like, what has this turned into? So in the ER, you went from doing your assessments, doing your treatment, to now mm-hmm. doing all of the paperwork, mm-hmm. answering all of the phone calls, mm-hmm. making the phone calls, so setting up your own transfers for transportation. Right. And it's, and it's just, it seems when you just present that one task, it seems, oh, that's doable. And right, that's what we're so good at. I can do that. Mm-hmm. Okay, bring it, you know? Um, and it's almost this stubbornness. You don't want to complain um, because that's what we do. We just get it done. But realizing that that just it looked so different and that it was getting to the point where it's like, yeah, and I'm not superhuman. I, you know, I would love to be able to clone myself, but <laughs> who wouldn't? The world's not ready for that, I don't think. But also, <laughs> I physically cannot be in room one with a, with a trauma and doing Q15 uh, neuro checks on a patient that I just hung TPA on. I physically can't. Yeah, so and, that critical that yeah. critical stroke patient that requires life-saving medications, you can't split yourself into mm-hmm. two. And there's also, it's like, and I don't have my phone-a-friend anymore because the phone-a-friend is just as overwhelmed and trying to do two, three jobs just like I am. So that's why I eventually left because I just, one, morally, I, I could no longer say I could say I gave it my best still, and I, but I could no longer say it. my best was oftentimes not even the basic standard of care. Sure. And legally, that worried me for my license and all. But more, more importantly, it was just the emotional toll. Where ethically, I just I I felt culpable by continuing to participate in a system that was just delusional in what it was asking of of, of its employees. You know. Sure. And that ultimately ended up leading you to write a letter Mm -hmm. and what was the title of that letter (laughs) my er exit letter (laughs) and that got posted on social media yeah so uh i was and it's it's kind of wild because so i wrote this letter before the before the pandemic so 2019 yeah almost four years ago yes to tomorrow yeah (laughs) tomorrow which is wild (laughs) uh initially i had just when i started writing that letter because for me, writing, uh, especially in the last, I don't know, the latter half of my professional career, found it, I realized it was a great way for me to process what I was seeing. So I started off writing that with the intent of just sending that to, to administration. And as I kind of went through the various edits, I also realized that, yeah, it was, you know, a piece of my mind, but it also was, not to be cheesy, but a little bit of a love letter to my 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 coworkers who I knew so many were feeling the these having these exact same thoughts and I wanted to share it just to so possibly someone else could read it and just know that maybe you know I'm not the only one having those thoughts sure and I also knew I was done I knew I was going to walk away and therefore I was like I'll take the fall you know I'll be the one that says it like it is because this is all things we're talking about in the nurse's station or after work and since I'm, I know I'm leaving, I'll, I'll put it out yeah, there. Yeah, you'll take the hit I'll on it. I'll take the hit. Yeah. And it's crazy how, because you said that was in 2019. Yeah. It is still relevant to today. It struck a chord with me. I had my editor reading it also, and we were discussing it before you came in today. One of the parts that hit me the 
hardest was when you say that you're making your employees make these ethical choices. You're telling your employees, essentially, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. essentially they're telling their employees, if you don't show up, Mm-hmm. You're fucking everybody else that's mm-hmm. working today. Mm-hmm. And you're not only screwing them, you're screwing the community that you are serving mm-hmm. by not showing up. And man, for COVID-19, holy smokes, dude. Totally. Holy smokes. The amount that I saw that where charge nurses were being told, you know, if you're not showing up, you're letting your, your coworkers down today. Right. And why did that, the, you know, responsibility for that, it fell as far down the chain as you possibly can. Yeah, to the lowest yep. totem pole, not not important, but the lowest employee that you could, which essentially is the floor nurses right. and the ER nurses, yeah. you know? Like, I can't control what, what these people are doing. Why aren't we trying to solve the problem? Yeah, exactly. That was the other thing that I really had a hard time with because one of the other things that I saw kind of start to evolve over the time I worked in the ER was this whole um, trend of, big hospital systems hiring outside consultant firms. So uh, I I won't say the names. I mean, how does that make sense? But yeah, yeah, so it's people that, you know, don't live in the community and they're there for a very short period of time. And they're looking at these, these zeros and ones, black and white, that you're missing, you know, you're missing the big picture. Because you can't, especially in the emergency room and emergency services, it isn't predictable by nature. Um, I think there's a line that I wrote in the uh, in the letter that still, especially after COVID hit, just gave me the, the like Ugh. the heebie-jeebies. heebie-jeebies. But I said we're barely you know something along the lines of they're barely staffing us for you know what we need to do the job, let alone the inevitability of the unexpected. Yes, because isn't that's what emergency services is? We you know you have the the bus of nuns <laughs> that crashes. <laughs> You have, and I, I just, this is all things that I'd seen. You just have those spikes where, where suddenly what is demanded of you is more than 100%. So if we are designing our hospital systems to constantly be running close to 100%, there's no room for that flux. Right, and it's not just the hospital systems. It's also EMS, right? If mm-hmm. there's one mass casualty incident mm-hmm. involving 20, 30 people, you have knocked out the entire system. Exactly. Right? I think, I mean, when I worked at the service here, it was, I think we had 30 ambulances on during the day. You have 30 patients. Mm -hmm. Maybe your two-tier system can help handle that with four, five ambulances, maybe. But you're going to need a lot more than that. And now you're also going down the road of what hospital systems can they go to. If this is a bad trauma and there's only one trauma system, Mm -hmm. You're taking up a lot of that trauma system's resources. Completely. That and that was the other thing. Also, just where we worked, um, we are the states, or we're the you know we're the it's the state's sole level one trauma center. Yeah. Um, I remember this uh, night when I was working at the smaller community hospital. That again, I had maybe a year or two experience in it, but it was great practice on mass casualties. <laughs> Because, you know, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and we started to have this huge influx of patients. And I think that that night we saw maybe we would have between like midnight and 7 a.m., maybe 20 people present, 20 patients present. We saw we had 75 people present because of bad chicken salad at a quinceanera. Holy smokes! (laughs) Yeah, that's an MCI for sure. It was. Everyone had like one of three last names. No one was staying in their room, right? Like it was just, it was chaos. That is chaos. But it was, it was good. It was good, safe practice on how to handle those, those kind of um, events. Uh, I, I, you probably didn't have enough bathrooms for that. No, or enough Zofran. <laughs> I remember the charge nurse just like opened the Pixis and like and just animals. handed Zofran to everyone. <laughs> and just like we just stuffed our pockets. And great. In that situation, I think maybe three were actually hospitalized. But yeah, you can it just one bad uh, chicken salad can just so easily overwhelm a system. 
<laughs> and this is a level three tiny community hospital. And I feel like as a level one trauma center, you have a responsibility to have the ability to kind of provide, to be a resource. Right. So I just, yeah, I was like, one bad chicken salad in this place is done. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> killing out the whole system. Right. I can't believe 75 people. How many people eat chicken salad? I have... <laughs> <laughs> I felt bad for whoever made that chicken salad. Like they probably have been like annexed from the family. Yeah, like, for sure. <laughs> they probably did. They were probably like, you're not allowed to cook ever. Again. Oh, it was hilarious. It was just yeah, it was just such a good memory. Everyone still had on their quinceanera outfits oh. and were just, you know, big poofy dresses and suits and boots and hats and <laughs> Oh man, that's terrible. Oh, but it really it really wakes you up yep. to how ready our service may be. I imagine if it's a smaller community, you probably only have two or three ambulances on at a time and Yeah, I don't know what the capacity I feel like there was more than that. And a lot of it just presented through the front door. I would hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would hope so. Yeah, thank thank you full for that. <laughs> but <laughs> but that's yeah, so I, I kind of saw this trend of was like you know, I'm a hard worker and I'm, I'm good at my job and I, I can multitask. And, um, and the fact that just on a normal Tuesday, I, I feel like I, I couldn't provide the, not my expectation of level of care, but just the basic yeah. level of care that that patient deserved. And I was like, I don't So after you wrote that letter, did you get any follow-up or reach through <laughs> that? I, well, so... Uh, there have been times where I say a little thank you to the universe that I didn't get contacted by a lawyer for slander or something like that. I mean, I read the letter. But you don't say any names. I don't. I don't. And I, really, it wasn't an attack on an individual. I was just trying to point out the flawed nature of this system. Like, we are spending millions of dollars on these consulting firms, um, and basically we're doing things to make our numbers look better that actually detract from patient care. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I put that on just on my Facebook cause you know, I wanted my coworkers to, to see it and it's, it was, it's wild. I also, I use a platform where writers can kind of publish things. So mm-hmm. instead of having my own blog, I use the website medium.com. So I, it was on medium, I think last time I checked, which was probably close to a year ago, um, you know, it's been shared 40,000 times. The reads were over 100,000. And then also um, a website, kevinmd.com, post, republished it. Wow. And that had also another, you know, 50,000 shares and and close to 200,000 reads. So it reached a huge audience. Yeah, and I did get it. I, you know, I still every once in a while get an email, you know, this really spoke to me or... I see this and uh, definitely that kind of that uptick came when the pandemic hit because, yeah, it was suddenly so relevant. Um, When I wrote it, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, like a bus crash or (laughs) food poisoning. Not a worldwide pandemic. Yeah, not a worldwide (laughs) pandemic, but it did. It made it just even more applicable. So that's great, though, that it reached that many people and it obviously felt relevant to them. Um, But did you get any call back from the hospital at all None. no reach out from no. the hospital oh that's kind of sad though I, they're probably glad you just weren't standing outside you know picketing and <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i mean i know they they read it and i i've had some friends and old co-workers that said there were several meetings about it which at least they had to have a couple yeah, meetings about i mean it. that's good right because that, <laughs> yeah that's good but I, it probably brought in a lot more social media social media regulations. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably about as far as that went, unfortunately. So often I feel like we know where the flaws in the system are. And oftentimes it just falls on deaf ears. And yeah, in hindsight, I'm glad I, I did it. The reach was so much further than I thought. I was expecting maybe 50 of my coworkers would feel yeah. stood up for. But I think it's important to realize, like, you never know. Like, one voice can... Can change. Can change. Not that it changed anything, but just the importance to to speak your truth. Again, see something, say something. Right. So do you have any ideas for solutions? Well, no. I mean, no. 
No. No, it's hard, right? Because know, we're taking yeah. nurses, and I've talked about this a little bit too, we're taking nurses straight out of nursing school and throwing them into trauma right. because we don't have any other choices because we're so short-staffed. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, our healthcare system is broken. The focus is on illness, um, not health. So ultimately, I think that that is the underlying um, we're being issue. We're reactive, yeah, not proactive. Exactly. Um, the thing with short staffing that I just don't agree with is it's so it's so short-sighted. There's so many. I know that the hospital that we worked at has had such a huge turnover, and I've spoken to you know keep in touch with a, a lot of our old coworkers, and so many of us say the same thing. Like I would be back there in a minute because I do miss that job. Sure, um, I love that job, but just not how the job is now. So I think yes, I think the the whole aspect is just so it was it's just very short sighted. Bottom line, end of the month numbers or annual profit. Yeah. Where, I mean, how much does it cost to train a nurse? How much does a malpractice lawsuit cost the hospital? Um, how much PTSD are you contributing to having employees that don't feel like they have the resources that they need? Yeah, it's interesting. So like I said earlier about the my nurse educator, and I think the other thing that he taught me that's just stuck with me, uh, which at first I just saw it as a way to become a better provider, but I, I realized that, oh, this is not just being a better provider, this approach, but also helping me process and helping me not develop PTSD. So he would always have, ask three questions from us after we had a case or uh, an event. What went well? What could have gone better? And what are you going to do different next time? And to this day, I, even as, as a school nurse, you know, <laughs> I had a kid jump off the swing set and broke his arm the other day, and I found myself after that just going through those three questions. And it doesn't take much time at all, but I also think it's so important not just to become better at what you do, but so often I think PTSD, one thing that contributes is feeling like you are acted upon by things outside of your control. And those three things take the control. You kind of own some of that control back, Sure. right? Like, yeah, I can't control that horrible thing that happened to that kiddo, but I did this well, I wish this went better, and next time I'll improve on it. And it gives you that, a little bit of that internal locus of control that I, I certainly feel like helped me. I mean, we all have PTSD, myself yeah. included, yes. but it did, it helped give me a little bit of ownership and, and control over just the wild, crazy things that we see. Yeah, those are those are great, and I could see those working well in a, in a debriefing situation yeah and it's funny because at the the other th- reason I left is I realized I'm not even I don't even have the time to process what I saw today right it's a uh, you know I have such strong memories of all this crazy stuff I've seen and and a lot of them don't come from working at the level one trauma center because the volume it was non-stop you didn't even have a time to you know take a deep breath and center yourself or even get a lunch yeah yeah anything so I think that's a, a one area of nursing. You know, we're throwing these new grads out there with minimum training, and we're not giving them the opportunity to reflect on their experience, and we're setting them up to to get you know Fail. PTSD. Yeah, we're setting way, them yeah much to faster burn out. Yeah, yeah, a lot faster than we were burned yeah. out. So we talked a little bit about. Um, the nursing education, mm-hmm. it, how do you feel about that? Well, um, again, I, I think it's just, it's short-sighted by the hospital um, and that they are looking at the very short term of uh, financial viability. And that wasn't always the case. Um, when I, you know, when I was a new grad, I was being trained by just life lifers, right? Like they had and will, would, you know, retired as ER nurses. And there are a couple of them, even in, you know, early 60s. They were just, um, and, and that is unheard of anymore. Yeah. Um, so often you'll have someone who's charge nurse or filling in as charge with, with two years experience, or maybe your seasoned nurse is four years experience. And, and it's scary because uh, at that point, you know, 
just enough to be overly confident and you don't know what you don't know. Um, I know that was a huge point of growth for me um, because you just get comfy. Like, yeah. I can do this. But man, you, you have those come to Jesus moments that if you don't really reflect on and kind of check yourself, uh, one, it will kind of keep you from, I think, advancing in, as a provider and the quality of care you give, but also uh, just really scary outcomes can happen. So it does worry me that, you know, look at the hospitals now. When I, when I left, we were fighting for a cost of living raise. Um, and then look, I mean, I, I don't have numbers, but I can only assume that every hospital, their payroll has to be through the roof right now yeah. because of all the travel nurses. And um, it is what it is, but I know, especially myself and again, friends of mine, I wanted to be there for my community during COVID. I did feel that desire, right? It's what we train for. It's yeah, what we do. It makes sense to help and be there. Right. And, and it's hard to go back to something yeah. that treated you so unfairly. Oh, I, I don't know if I'd be welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but um, so I think just thinking about nurse, new nurse education as, a, as an investment, um, not so much as we are all replaceable cogs, that you pop one out or one gets a little too sassy or too demanding, well, whatever, you can go somewhere else. And with the expectation that you can just put someone into that same position. Because if you think about also with our our profession, how much just mutual trust, respect, if you work with someone that you know, it's almost magic. You can read each other's minds. Yeah. You're just like a well-oiled machine versus with someone that you maybe met a couple days prior. And also just, um, yeah, nurses are not, not ready. You, when you first come out um well and i think and i can't i can't speak because i'm not a nurse but i i feel like in looking at how the program is designed there's not really a lot of education offered to nurses mm -hmm. after you start as a nurse at a hospital which is unfortunate i mean so you know when i was in nursing school i had a good friend that was in the program with me and her sister had was an er nurse and graduated a couple years prior my friend wanted to go into ICU, and I knew I wanted to go into the ER. So we were kind of scheming on things we could do to kind of go above and beyond, make ourselves stand out, right? Sure. And man, we we pretty much just had to show up at the the paramedic programs, ACLS classes, PALS, yeah. PLS. And that's not like, education. That's a required right? certification. But not even for nurses. That wasn't even part of that's our nursing so curriculum. Crazy. And. You know, I'm, I'm thankful I was at a point in my life when I didn't have kids and I could kind of take that extra leap and and read up on things on my own and look into the path of physiology and talk to people about how do you see what you saw? What did I miss? So, and there's just, there's no focus on that anymore. And there's also no space for it to even take place. Right, because how do you justify, do you, how do you justify giving the nurse the education, right? So do you take them off their shift. Mm -hmm. So now you down the ER a shift of a nurse or a quarter of the nurses because everybody has to Man, education. Or do you pay overtime? That's you how it used to be. Day? I mean, when I was in my new grad phase, I would work two floor shifts and then I had eight hours of class and then I was expected to do an additional four hours to make the 12 on my own through um, the training was called Enoch, I believe which I know the ERs still use for their new grads, but um, like anything with online education, it's what you make of it. So yes, you can read the chapter and click, click, click through the test mm -hmm. and, and not retain anything. Um, when I went through it, yeah, it was, it was divided up by system type. So not only did we have to read the chapter, um, pass the test, uh, we had to then relate it to a, a patient that we were part of taking care of, so it made it real. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm not all for make them write, write papers, but it did. You had to think about it, organize your thoughts, and present it to it your researcher. So I, I and I, I've seen that just disappear from education, which is sad because it's not just my opinion that this is a good way to educate. Um, you know, the quote there there was uh, the early 1900s. There was a psychologist, and he made some major changes in educational systems with his theories. He was also a philosopher, John Dewey. And his quote is, one doesn't learn by doing, one learns by reflecting on doing. 
And yes, you can learn by doing, you know, like I told you earlier, my kiddos will do the math facts cards, which is just route memorization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that age, their brain's a little more prime to learn that way. But certainly at in your 20s, it doesn't work that way. No. It's just, it's this whole, this is what you do when this happens, but we don't talk about or integrate or give people time to even make that applicable to their own experience, which is how you really learn, right? Sure. So there's multiple theories on education and how how people learn that I that I just see completely ignored and has, has fallen out. Why? Because it, it costs money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think it has to. I mean, I, when I started as a new grad, I did sign a contract with the hospital that I was not that I would be there for two years. Right? They weren't going to put time and energy into me to have me just leave at the end of my training. Yeah. So yes, I think that's a start at least is to stop looking at techs, medics, nurses as just these cogs that you can just get. You know, one leaves and you pop a new one in, and it works. The machine works just fine. Yeah. Because it's it doesn't. I think if you are integrating it well enough and this is my own personal you know opinion i when people are paying for me to get educated i'm more likely to be more loyal right because i want to learn that's why i'm here i'm here to learn exactly and our profession is ever changing right so you know <laughs> if, if you think about you know what the acls algorithms looked like 20 years ago it's almost laughable in some ways <laughs> Um, So, yeah, I think when you have a profession that there is so much change and uh, that is part of the job, then that's part of the employer's uh, responsibility to support that, not just expect it to happen on one's own time. So I'd worked at this community hospital and worked a little bit with the unit educator as well for that hospital, and then I went to flight. And when I left flight, I I was pregnant at the time, and there was several other reasons that I just felt the universe was pointing me in a different direction, or kind of like, hey, you shouldn't be doing this right now. And I went to, I had a good friend that that worked at the uh, Level 1 Trauma Center, and so I, I got a job there. And I was just, I was, I remember being like, oh my goodness, like the amount of case studies that this place has is phenomenal. Right. You see so much weird stuff that I'm learning something every single day. And I know that if, if we supported or encouraged people to have like a grand rounds or present that to their coworkers, it would make all of us such better providers. But that was never it was never talked about no. and and then but to do things but then we also had to jump through all these hoops to kind of justify our worth to them with yeah. our whatever annual binder that we had to turn in which was just busy work it was just bullshit it's like why why aren't we doing something that you know okay we have to do, spend time on this why aren't we doing something that makes us all better the incentive for that was a raise is that correct yeah yeah and it was kind of like the the, I think there was three tiers, levels of nurse, and and it made a it made a significant difference. But it did, you know, all of us spent a day or two on our day off putting together this stupid binder of nonsense, <laughs> proving that we were worth what we were asking for. Right. And uh, it was nothing more than just a waste of time. Right. So how do we how do we practice evidence based medicine if we're not given the tools to do so? You know how how we're just. I think there's a lot of expectation from mm-hmm. the doctors as mm-hmm. providers also to be stepping up and to be paying attention, but I think that also calls for responsibility from the nurses to have an idea of what they're doing also. Right. I mean, ultimately, it, it, I do think the responsibility is on the individual, but that's a big ask, especially with how how busy um, nursing shifts are now. Right. Like you said, you don't get a time to eat or pee or anything. No. And you leave the shift just being like, I like want to check out. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to think about this. The last thing I want to do is, is, yeah, pull out a textbook or do some research on um, whatever that procedure my patient went went to that I hadn't heard of before, or why why the doc, you know, or follow up with the doctor. Why why did you go with this med instead yeah. of the other? So again, like it's the responsibility, it's the blame is placed on the very end of the, the chain, you know, yeah. on, on the individual employee where 
they're we're not being set up for to to practice like that. Yeah, it's not being encouraged. There's no success story here. Yeah, There's, it's only failure, which is unfortunate. Yeah, but uh, you said you had done some time as a flight nurse. Did you do rotor or fixed wing? I did rotor. Yes, you did rotor. Yeah, Oof, you're brave. <laughs> so I have no interest I, in ever being on a rotor. But. I loved it. Um, probably it probably started my one of my uncles just retired. He was a helicopter pilot for several EMS um, ambulance companies up in the Pacific Northwest. So I blame him taking me on helicopter check rides when I was a little girl. <laughs> That's really cool. Though. That's neat. Yeah. That's really cool, especially that he was with it so long that he retired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he had, gosh, 30 years, I think, he flew. So did you do mostly scene calls, or did you do IFTs? Um, so it was a little bit of both. So I flew in the northern part of our state. Our base was pretty busy as far as scene calls go. Yeah, Taos is known a lot for their skiing, so especially yes. in the winter. Yeah, right? yeah. And also because of our emergency services, you know, are very condensed to a central area. And because our state is so rural, oftentimes if if it's serious, you know, the an ambulance maybe thirty minutes out and a lot sure. of times they'll just they would call us before if it sounded bad, you know. That was another thing, you know, pretty I knew I wanted to go into the ER and this is what I was gonna do and then very quickly I realized, oh, and, and flight nursing is the next the next yeah, goal. That's the next tier, right? Yeah. Because there's a there's a a whole other level of education mm-hmm. and critical care that you have to step up to mm-hmm. for flight nursing. Right. So, um, and that experience was incredible. Um, at that time, my husband and I had gotten married right around the time I started flying or a little bit after. And he is a firefighter paramedic. And wow, that was, that was so eye-opening just to feel going from something nursing at that point I'd felt pretty comfortable in, had seen a lot of stuff. The aspect of being in a helicopter is one thing, but then also the aspect of scene calls. I remember my first one. I was like, "What? What? What are we? T- we're in a what dirt parking lot." Like, right now. <laughs> yeah, it was just. Um, but I, I did enjoy that uh, pressure, or just kind of the responsibility of of. It's, yeah, it's it's on you and your partner, yeah, and you are stabilizing out. that patient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that uh, there's nothing like it. Nothing like it. It's not for everybody, but it when you figure it out and it clicks, it's really yeah. cool. It's a really neat experience. Yeah, that is that is the job I would go back to tomorrow. If, yeah, <laughs> if it was right for my family and everything. Sure, I do. I do miss miss flying so much. There's yeah. nothing like it. What uh, do you have any favorite calls from any of your experience? It calls or patients? Yeah. Oh, so many. So much of my writing has to do along the times of when I was flying, just because you're, you know, you're so intimately involved. Yeah, you're hyped up and it's just Oh, yeah, and the adrenaline's <laughs> going, and yeah. I think this is one of my favorites because the outcome was so good. Okay. Um, <laughs> just ruin the story, but... Uh, That's right. And it was just so freaking bizarre, you know. It was just, you know, like, you cannot make this stuff up. So we had gotten dispatched. It was, it was dark. It was, I want to say, like 8 or 9 o'clock. And we were dispatched to the ski basin. It was not ski season, but so it was kind of like the tail end of camping. Mm-hmm. And there were some campgrounds up that area. So the initial dispatch was to a campground. And we weren't very far away, but maybe in the 15 minutes it took us to, to get ready and you know start headed that direction. The, the location kept changing. And you could tell, we assumed, or hope, uh, that they were kind of coming down the mountain. Right? Yeah. So we meet up with the ambulance, and it was a kid with obvious head trauma, maybe, I don't know, 13, 14. He was a John Doe, obvious head trauma, and, but he was still fighting, and, and they didn't have RSI capabilities. So we RSI'd him in the back of the ambulance, and... Uh, tried to get the story that they had and the story from from the medic was this was you'll never believe this this kid came flying through the forest (laughs) so there was a doctor and his family who had decided to take a 
like end of year camping trip and no one else was around. It was pretty cold, you know, but so they were the only people camping in that campground. And the campground was situated below the road up to the ski basin. And what the doctor told the medic is they heard a crash, breaking glass, mm-hmm. and this kid supermaned into their campsite. Like, avoided all the trees by a miracle, flew through the forest, and fell into their campsite. <laughs> and that poor doctor's probably like, I can't even get a break. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to take a vacation. <laughs> so was he in a car? Assumed. Assumed he the was in a car. The doctor said it sounded like a car accident, but he couldn't see the road. Really. Right. So he ran up to the road looking for the, you know. The vehicle The vehicle, or something. and nothing. There was nothing there. There was broken glass. So he ran back down the hill and could tell that this kiddo had major head trauma and needed to get to, to a hospital. Yeah. Um, no cell phone service. Of course. So this, you know, angel of a man picked up this kiddo, put him in the back of his car, and started driving down the ski base until he got service, called 911, told him to launch a helicopter, and rendezvoused with the local EMS. Do you know what kind of doctor he was? I don't. I well, would love to probably, meet him someday. He probably wasn't, like, a podiatrist or... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He probably wasn't a foot doctor. I would love, I've always imagined that he was an ER doc because that just seems like one of the, like, what the heck? Like, things that happen to medical <laughs> providers, you know, emergency medical providers. Like, are you joking me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the story we had. We had, you know, John Doe completely guessing on age, no idea, just obvious head trauma and some broken bones and... So we intubated him and then loaded him up and flew him to the level one trauma center. And that was the funniest report I have ever, ever given. (laughs) Because you know how it is in, you know, trauma ones where oftentimes you guys have to give your report multiple times. So, right? Because everyone, you know, more people are coming in and yeah, what do you say? Um, this is John Doe. I think he's like 13. We're calling him whatever, 40 kilos. Uh, he flew through the forest and hit his head real bad. <laughs> right? And I had all these docs and residents like, does he have any allergies? I, I don't even... I, <laughs> right? Does he yeah. take medicine? I have no idea. Does he look conscious to you? <laughs> he flew through the forest. <laughs> Unknown mechanism. <laughs> That's so crazy. I wonder if they ended up like finding a car. They did. They did. Okay. Yeah. And he was the only one in the car. No. It's just, I mean, this is a sad story, but he, oh. he he ended up amazing. The kid recovered and w- walked out of the hospital. Wow. He did go into CYFD custody though because um, he was with uh, his mother and aunt. They were intoxicated. Mm. Not sure if they knew that he had been ejected, but they had had crashed the car, but it was able, it was drivable. So not not sure if they knew that he had been ejected out the rear side window. Like he was unrestrained, probably like kind of laying down in the back. And So they found them, and I don't know if you know all the details, this mm-hmm. story is just getting crazier and crazier. <laughs> They've... <laughs> can't make this up. <laughs> the car, like the car left? Mm-hmm. Oh my god. So they crashed. They, they crashed. This poor kid got ejected, uh-huh. flew through the forest, happened to find an angel of a doctor. Yes. Got transported, is doing fine, but the drunk mother and aunt kept driving. Yes. Either choosing Apparently, to leave him yeah. or not knowing he was not in the vehicle. But we had followed up with PD like a week after, and they said that they caught them trying to, like, dispose of, of the booze in the car, of the alcohol, S- which makes me kind of feel like they... They had an idea. Right. Like, why? They were trying to hide something. But, <laughs> yeah, just just one of those, like, <laughs> what? I would say it's <laughs> just a New Mexico thing, but it's not. It's a, this is, I, we're hearing, I think with news outlets, we're hearing more stories like this all yeah. over, you know? It's, so that's, that's probably my... My favorite story from flight, just flying through the forest. WTF factor, like (laughs) he must have had angels all around him because it's a heavy, you know, it's very wooded. It's heavily wooded. Yeah, and the road is, you know, probably 150 feet up an embankment. Like what? 
and just happened. And the campground was, was so quiet. Like, you know, it was just happened to be this one family that is campground he flew into, and it happened to be a physician who knew that this kid needed immediate medical yeah. attention. And it, and what? Yeah, because what do you think a lay person would have done? You know, like yeah, because that was the thing when we, you know. The time sensitive nature. I mean, when we showed up, we already signed him right away because he was obviously losing his airway. Yeah. So it's just one of those things that everything, I mean, it was such a disaster, but everything lined up perfectly because if anyone had hesitated well. a, a minute or two, yeah. like, the outcome I think would have been very different. That's an insane. <laughs> That's a good one. That, uh, wow. Do you have any other ones that are like just oh. nuts like that? The other kind of funny one was, again, it was very rural. It was New Year's Day. This kid was maybe like 21 and was, quote unquote, minding his own business. And his girlfriend stabbed him in the back with a knife. Yeah, he was just eating breakfast. Just because. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Sure, pal. (laughs) So he... uh, He was was stable. Breast sounds were good, you know. but he did admit to having an opiate addiction and, and on, like had some pain, obviously. And so we got him loaded up. And once we're in the air, you know, I just realized I'm not going to touch this kid's pain with any, any opiates. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I tried to talk to him and, you know, keep him kind of calm. He told me about his son and just a little bit about him, himself. And so I'm like, well, let's try ketamine, you know. See if that, that helps. I love ketamine. I do too. It was also the flight that taught me that oftentimes a little bit of Versed with ketamine goes, goes real well because I'd just given him ketamine and he freaked out. He went down the cake hole. Oh, yes. <laughs> but new, but not completely disassociated. I mean, again, that's something I learned from it. Like, you either have to go big or <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't go big enough. So he was, I was worried he was going to, he was trying to open the helicopter door. Oh my goodness. Like he was out of his mind. And you know how it's so loud and you have your, your helmet on yeah. and he has the earphones on and he's sitting <laughs> up in the, in the seat this and just, guy. <laughs> just crawling out of his skin and like going for the door. And I'm like, no, 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 no. So my partner's drawing up the Versed and I'm trying to just like keep him focused. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I can't remember saying, Matt, Matt, I need you to look at me. You're gonna be okay. Like just trying to <laughs> like hold him to reality by a thread. You're okay. You're gonna be fine. <laughs> We're gonna take you to the hospital, and then you'll see your son. You gotta pull together for your son. And he goes, "I have a son!" And then I freaked out even more. <laughs> Wrong thing to say. <laughs> So far down the gate hole, he didn't even remember he had a kid. No, <laughs> who's just talking about? Yeah. Oh man, I love ketamine so I much. I know. I think the very first time I saw ketamine used was in my <laughs> my paramedic internship. I was doing a rotation at the hospital, and they were giving it to a young lady who had to have a spot on her arm lanced mm-hmm. because she was skin popping. And skin popping is when you uh, use heroin or you use some other medication that you inject so regularly that you no longer have veins to inject into. So people start injecting it into their muscles or kind of wherever they can find. And she did it in her deltoid. So it caused a really huge abscess. abscess. Yeah. Yeah, so a huge infection pocket. And they had to cut it with a scalpel to relieve the infection from the arm. So they gave her ketamine and mm-hmm. my preceptor was like come watch this this is gonna be good and I was like okay cool so they give her the ketamine and she just you see her eyes open up really big and she lays herself back and she's like I'm in space I'm lost I'm in space right now where are we it's like everybody's like you're okay and they're doing this lance and the she didn't even feel the pain. She didn't care about that. No, like, no cares. I'm in just, space. I'm in space. <laughs> she's just yelling. We're in trauma four. She's just screaming her head off. Uh, that was. I was like, holy shit! Or like that's poking so their head good around stuff. the room. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it was so. That what a neat experience. I love ketamine so much. It is, and also the like pediatric sedations. I'm. 
the kids the things kids have said coming out of the K-hole, I just think are <laughs> just hilarious. What have they said? Just, you know, because kiddos have such a crazy sense of imagination yes, as they it do. is. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot of like space or like, I was a tiger, you know, just this, the one where I, this kiddo came out of the K-hole after we, you know, splinted his arm. He looked at his mom and said, I want to do that every day. Oh my God. I was like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Ketamine's bad. Yeah. No, nobody. It's a poor life choice. <laughs> poor life choice. So. You just opened the, yeah, the gateway like, oh, drug was ketamine today. <laughs> I feel like, like, yeah, this was the first of... <laughs> maybe, maybe, hopefully nothing. Hope hopefully nothing, yeah. <laughs> well, that's good because you hear, you see a lot of them that... That don't have good good outcomes. <laughs> good yeah. trips, yeah. yeah. I that's I'll tell you, I'm one that will never do anything like that because I have such a negative look. <laughs> like, right. I would have a bad trip because I think I'd have a bad trip. Right. So I'll never do drugs yeah. like that. You just go into it like yeah. not setting yourself yeah, up. This is for not success. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to have a good mindset. But the they're doing some really cool. Well, I mean, just the autonomy of ketamine. Period. I mean, mm-hmm. we use it for sedation. We use it for uh, keeping patients like chemically sedated when they're vented. Mm-hmm. But they're also doing ketamine uh, therapy, where they're microdosing right. ketamine, and I think that is such a cool thing. Right. I could probably get down on microdosing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, It's. I. I would try. I mean, I. I think especially you know in this profession, there's so much PTSD and mental health issues and um, there's so many legal ways uh, to cope that are really you know slippery slopes yes um, so uh, yeah I think going to a psychiatrist or a therapist and microdosing ketamine is way better than you know going to total wine probably in the grand <laughs> yes, it probably is yeah. it probably is I think uh, I think they just opened one up here either here or in Santa Fe they mm-hmm. have a clinic for PTSD for microdosing Santa Fe seems like a place that they would yeah, a little, little more richer yeah. than it is here. Yeah, yeah. rich and hippie. <laughs> yeah. I, I, would you ever try that, do you think? I think I would. Do you think that you need it for your current PTSD state? I don't, I don't think so. I think if I had not left the emergency room when I did, I could tell it was building up really quick. Sure. And um, yeah, it definitely, it was wild to me how much that continued to show up for the couple years after I left. It was almost like I had the space for that thing, for those things to kind of rise to the surface. I wasn't continuing to fill up and push the bottle down. Yeah. <laughs> Do you mind I, if I ask how your symptoms were presenting for you? Um, yeah, not at all. For me, it was, it was, I remember being like, gosh, what is this? Like, I just didn't, wouldn't want anyone to touch me or like be near me, right? Which is really hard when you have little kids. Yeah. And I'm like, God, I'm just like, oh, like, just give mama some space. Um, almost a feeling of, not like ketamine disassociation. <laughs> but I remember times like going to the grocery store and just feeling like this is, you, you kind of watch people go through their daily lives and feeling like this means nothing. Like yeah. this seems so trivial. Yes. Why, why are we living these right. lies? Yeah. And yeah, some, I mean, some depression, like fatigue like lack of motivation, all of those is definitely how, how it, it presented for me. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. This is, I don't have any, anything that supports this theory at all. This is just mine. But one thing I noticed is I feel like trauma, um, it's almost like you're a witness to something that almost has a physical energy. So right. Like with flight, some of the, the bad flights I had affected me so much more because that trauma was dispersed between you and your partner. Yes. Right? You're sh- it's shared. It's shared. And it's like, well, you're going to split that halfway. And then where maybe when you're working at a large hospital, there's 20 people in the room. So maybe you get 1 20th of that trauma or, you know. And then so there's the whole how much of that trauma you kind of feel responsible for or how, you know, how many people are there to share it with you. And then also just the number of events, right? So in flight, the bad calls were much harder for me to work through or kind of I felt like I knew I needed to work through them, but the actual number of them was less. However, when I was in the hospital, 
I was maybe taking on way less trauma from each patient, bad patient. However, the number of, tra- of that just compounded. And I found that harder to deal with because it's like you don't even know where to start. Yeah. You can't even remember what patients you saw the day before. <laughs> Right. So yeah, and it when I started in EMS, it was like I could remember almost every patient, mm-hmm. right? And you're charting because you have to chart so much when you're charting in EMS, and I could, you know, I didn't understand why some people would be like, well, in seven years, you know, when you're getting sued or whatever, mm-hmm. you're not going to remember this. No, I got this. Okay, I couldn't tell you what I ran yesterday yet right. when I was on shift. Right. No. Now I'm like, no. Nope. No clue. Yeah, and it's they all start blending together. It's like right. oh, I've seen seen this cluster before, and so writing for me was was is still huge with some of the harder ones because yeah, when when I left flight, it was again I, I miss it so much, but I had this kind of series of three incidents that just one after another after another that it was just so much, you know. Do you feel comfortable talking? Yeah, about it? yeah. Um, the first one. So it's, it's really interesting also listening to the show, like how many, how, I mean, it's like, oh, I'm not alone. Because you are not alone. So many of these stories, maybe the situation was different, but people say verbatim, like things that someone was talking about, the kids' shoes. And I was like, whoa, like that's, yeah. that's, yeah. I think it's easy for us to internalize these things and, and make it feel like we're by ourselves, mm-hmm. but we're not. And every there's so many other people that also do this, and mm-hmm. we just don't want to either, you know, we don't want to embarrass ourselves, mm-hmm. or we want to have the pride like this doesn't affect me. Right. And so we don't share these stories, right. but we need to. Yeah, We need it's to so share important. these stories. We need to show people that you're not alone in the way that you think, and there are outlets mm-hmm. for you. Yeah, and also the process of writing for me, it's just, it's almost like I put it on paper and then you go back and edit and change things and kind of like, well, this would make more sense if I put this earlier in the story. So it's almost like this physical manipulation where it, it helps me just process the memory. So the first one that happened was a scene call and we got, um, my partner and I were sent to the state, in, to Colorado, like very rural southern area, and it was in the middle of winter. And the, it was two young boys that had fallen through, through ice and like a cold water drowning. Oof. Yeah. And one was probably three and then the other one was maybe seven or eight. I think. Well, it's young. So, um, so again, we got dispatched to the scene, but then the EMS that showed up had scooped up the kids and, and took them to a very rural medical center so that's where we met them and I mean it was it was wild it you know cold water drowning they I mean it was like that time where I I had hope right because we all read about those cases where it's you know you have someone with no signs of life yeah. but and it was cold water so kids have a higher thermic, chance right yeah. and um and also when we showed up there was one doctor there and she, I'm, I'm not even sure if she had fiz- finished her residency, like she was doing a kind of like a moonlighting. So she was like, this is y'all's. Like, I don't, I have. Thank God the flight team's here. Yeah, yeah. no idea what to do. So, you know, we ended up, and also for me as a nurse, you know, how much comfort you take in having a great paramedic partner. And there was two boys, you know, so he went with one and I went with the other. And um, the paramedic that took them, to the hospital had already tried to intubate a couple times and wasn't successful. So just having that moment where it's like, I have to dig down and figure this out because I don't want to have to intubate a three-year-old. I've never intubated a kid before, but we did. And so I did, it was successful. And um, we were far enough away from major cities that, you know, being in the middle of the winter in a cold ass helicopter, they were, you know, we were better in that small hospital where we could actively warm them yes. and had a team of people to help, to help stabilize and yeah and um the older kiddo they they called it fairly quickly a couple out like an hour maybe but and this was having had no signs of life no, they were yeah. literally just trying to warm them up mm-hmm. okay and so you know the kiddo i worked with we intubated him and you know warmed the the air through the vent and did um you know, warm fluid lavage into 
uh, into his bladder and even chest, you know, warm fluid into his chest cavity. And he had times where he would start, like, there would be an organized rhythm, Mm -hmm. you know, and then it would disappear, right? Still a PEA or... Still a PEA. So, so he had a rhythm showing up on the monitor. His heart was trying to show through mm-hmm. electro, electrical activity, but it wasn't actually pumping. No, it yeah. wasn't. Um, but it was enough that ga- it gave us all like, oh my gosh, like this, we're making a difference. Like this might be the, the kiddo that makes it. Yeah. And yeah, that one, that one was really hard because they, they hard. were so young. Um, the thing where it related to me with the shoes, um, uh, I'm so thankful for to this this small rural communities paramedic because he could tell I was just I was shooting myself that I was gonna have to like I have to I'm gonna be the one to debate this yeah. three year old, and he said, "Well, I'm bagging him. She's getting you set up. I mean, just take a minute." So he gave me this minute to just collect my thoughts, and then I have to always be doing something. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna make sure all this clothes are off, all, you know, that we've got all the wet clothes off. And I pulled back the blanket and it was literally the same pair of shoes that I had put on my my son before I went on shift. Like the same cartoon character, Velcro shoes, about the same size. And it was just that moment of like, okay. Yeah. Oh, my uh, professional detachment has been breached upon <laughs> and... Uh... <laughs> it's been invaded, Yes. Guys. Oh God. Yeah, that's rough. Um, so yeah, yeah, that was, that was a, a really rough, rough one. And I still think about that family and, you know, send them thoughts and good energy. Cause I just, I can't, I can't even imagine. No, but in that process, you were able to perform an intubation mm-hmm. that maybe you'd utilize on a future kiddo and maybe not be able to save the life mm-hmm. of that kid, but you might be able to have a future kid, you know? Right. Yeah, and that was definitely the call that made me realize how powerful writing was for me because, again, like I know it's been talked about on your show, how what triggers something is not what triggers someone else, some, someone else. And so often it's because of a personal experience. It's a childhood trauma, something that we that individuals had. So if anyone wants to read more, I, I'll give you the link to the story. We'll but put the link in. Yeah, I did write a story where, you know, kind of, memoir of some of my childhood trauma and my memories and kind of identifying like what was this I mean obviously this is a tragic case but there's something deeper here this is yeah, affecting me on a different affect level why did you so bad yeah. yeah no and that makes sense I think I think it's easy too to forget that we are people mm-hmm. we're humans mm-hmm. you know we can't we can't detach 100% right and if you could detach 100% there's something wrong with you yeah yeah, you're probably a psycho. Yeah, you're a fucking psycho. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> you shouldn't be able to to do that. And if we could, we'd be robots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was that was a tough one. That was definitely probably the hardest. Well, close to the hardest call. Um, then uh, I want to say a couple months later, we had we were doing a IFT. For another kiddo, he was a little bit older, but him and his friend had decided to drink a bunch of Robitussin and try to get high. So did this kiddo need a helicopter? No, but he needed, you know, he had a knack drip, so an acetylcysteine. And for some reason that's not, you know, it's like, no, a paramedic, you can't give them the blessing because I'm sure they can handle this, right? <laughs> so I think it is in the scope. Like, uh... In the state, I think it is in the scope, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. It, it was also, it was dependent. in Colorado too, yeah. so maybe. Oh, that's true. So again, very rural hospital. It was two boys. One of them went by ground, and then we flew the other. Just, I think we flew him because his liver functions looked worse off. Sure. And it was it was one of those things, you know, I know in flight, they always tell you, you listen to your gut. Like, if you have a bad feeling, like, it takes three to go, one to say no, right? Yeah. And I, I knew that. What I didn't know is how easily you can discredit that voice. Because I heard it, you know? You shouldn't take this flight. Because of weather or because of why were you saying no? I don't... Weather was looked okay, but it was going to be bumpy. Okay, so some turbulence. Some turbulence. Which we deal with. Right? Um, but I just had this feeling. I was like, you shouldn't take this flight. And, and very quickly, I, I remember thinking, oh, Jessica, 
don't know. It's because it's 3 a.m. You're supposed to get off at 7. You're going to fly to another state. And also my family and I have been happy. Yeah, I had family in Colorado. So we were planning to drive up that next morning. Oh, goodness. So I'm like, I'm, I just completely wrote it off to me being selfish that no one wants to fly to the place that they have to turn around and fly back and then drive six hours yeah. to. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so when we were... We loaded up this kiddo, and, and when we were crossing the Rockies from the western to the eastern side, the weather had, was just, the wind was just unbelievable. Yeah, you got rocked. Huh? Rocked, you know, like downdraft type stuff. The, um, just the position of where the wind was coming from was just changing. It was dark outside, and the pilot had said something about, like, I, I can't, I can't get her to pull up. And I can't go down. And we had pulled the, the, the map out on the iPad, and literally we were flying into a horseshoe of mountains. Ugh. So we had mountains on all three sides that we couldn't see very close. And, um, yeah, control of the aircraft was severely compromised. So um, that pilot, Katie, is a badass, and she saved... <laughs> saved all of us yeah, and she scary. got us out but it was it was terrifying you know and it wasn't just a one moment it was 20 minutes of hearing the helicopter make noises i had never heard before yeah they're getting wrenching metal yes the, yes oh. so throw You're it giving around me goosebumps. <laughs> and, i don't like it <laughs> and just that feeling of just i was so i just feel i felt so mad and sad i was like this we don't need to be up here right this kid could have gone by ground if kind of the politics were different than they were, than they are. It's gotten worse. If critical care ground ambulances were something that are supported. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the pilot was a mom. You know, we had this kid on board. A mom was going to lose their kid. I was pregnant at the time. Uh, you know, my partner had just gotten engaged, and she, you know, was had plans, and I was just like, this is just so stupid. And I just... And all you can think of it for me is, like, the headlines, right? Like, mm -hmm. what is this going to say tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I could hear, because I could hear you going down that path. Yeah. Mom, son. Exactly. Future mom. Right. Brand new like, engagement. Yeah. For what? I mean, it's, and I, that took away kind of some of the, oh, the glory or the, oh, yeah. flight nursing. Because so much of what we do is stuff that probably could go with a critical care you ground transport. Yeah, other means, right? Right. Or in a fixed wing. Right. So, so anyways, we had to do a... Um, emergency landing and uh in this small small town and landed in a bank parking lot <laughs> we all like kissed the asphalt yeah i'm <laughs> like, sure we got out i'm sure you did and uh not just very quickly a sheriff showed up and he apparently we buzzed his house so close oh jeez that's how he like he showed up he responded so quickly not because he heard anything on the radio um and so we transported this kid. We still had to complete the transport, right? So we ended up going by ground to an airport and then flew fixed wing to the children's hospital. And I think it really sunk in. Because you know when you have something like that happen and you're like, did that just happen? Like, I see, did I really feel like I was going to, this was going to be it for 15 minutes? You start to question that. But when we we're in the, um, the airplane, you know, you can overhear commercial airline traffic, mm -hmm. which you don't um, necessarily in helicopter, just when you're in, in certain airspaces. And just to hear the, the radio traffic from like the Delta pilots and United, how much they were not freaking out, but just the, the turbulence was from 50 feet all the way up. Yeah. And yeah, so that was... The Rockies throw out some shade, man. They some of the worst turbulence I've felt was going mm -hmm. into to Denver and Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. where you just get rocked the whole way down, and you're like, "How can the airplane bend this? Right. How is this <laughs> physically possible?" <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So I couldn't imagine doing that in a helicopter. That is scary. Yeah. yeah. So so that was that was frightening, and you know, took a little bit of time off. We all did to process uh -huh. that one. And then the third thing that happened that I was like, okay, <laughs> this is not what I'm meant to be doing is, I don't want to talk too much about this story because I didn't reach out to the person to make sure it was okay, but um, ended up showing up on a scene call and, and 
that was a motorcycle accident. And thankfully we didn't put two and two together until after all of our interventions were done and we were, we were close to the hospital, but realizing it was, it was someone we knew, mm. um, the fiance of, of someone very close to us. And that was, that's when I was like, I'm, this is, this is too much right now. I feel it's like, like one of the worst parts of working in EMS is you, the, there is always that chance. And that's kind of one of the big reasons I left Las Cruces was mm-hmm. because in the very short period of time that I worked in, uh, on the ambulance in Las Cruces and then for the volunteer fire department, I did run a couple of family members where it was like, I don't want to see this. I don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. Let's go somewhere where we don't know anybody. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And in that way, I was thankful that we didn't make that association it's wild how you can look at someone in the face and put a c-collar on them or my partner intubated her and just i mean yeah still not didn't the make that connection yeah and i'm glad we didn't until until the end but um yeah so that was that was my that was my final final flight yeah well, but that's a rough trio of it was of it was. calls man but um yeah, but I, I do I do miss it. I love I loved that job and and uh, yeah, just needed to be on the ground and being pregnant. Man, I was tired of like showing up and being like, whose flight suit am I gonna borrow today? Because <laughs> mine doesn't fit, <laughs> and anyway. the one I borrowed last week doesn't fit. So <laughs> that's funny. And not even something I would have considered. Did you have any embarrassing stories while you were out in the EMS world? Oh, plenty. Yes. <laughs> Like I said, see something, say something. It does uh, also lend to just making an ass out of yourself. Sure. <laughs> but, um, well, there's there's two. The first one was when I was a new nurse and was working at the smaller hospital. And I remember it because it was just one of the most intense acute psych patients I had ever seen as well. Um, you know, just had that drunk, crazy strength. So she, this, this patient come, came in who was a frequent flyer, and I saw her for years and years after that I remember thinking like she is like not even five foot and it is taking all of these guys to hold her down Mm -hmm. and she's screaming just horrible things and I was so new um I hadn't developed my dark dark sense of humor (laughs) so the stuff she was saying and accusing them of was making me just flush and just like oh my gosh and um so he has a spit mask on and four point restraints and and my charge nurse came up to me reminds me of Katie because he used to always whenever he was charged he would wear cowboy boots so you could like hear him clumping <laughs> clacking and down he had this <laughs> great southern accent and uh, he goes you're up grasshopper <laughs> I was like for what <laughs> uh, he handed me a couple syringes like a B fifty two and was like get in there <laughs> so. EMS and PD had transferred her to the bed, but she was still thrashing and just yelling and screaming. And the the spit mask, she'd kind of worked up her face. So at this point, like her one of her eyes was the only thing kind of covered. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, early or mid twenties, and I'm like, excuse me, excuse me, pardon me, officer. Right? Like, I'm just coming through. I have meds for her. And I get to the foot of the bed and and she she just stops. Like it's the first time since she walked in through the EMS doors that there's been quiet. And she like kind of lifts her head up and looks at me at the foot of the bed as much as you can when you're restrained restrained in four point, (laughs) you know, leathers. (laughs) She said, you, I know you girl. And like flicked her head. So the spit mask goes flying and everyone just stopped, you know, cause she just like acknowledged me so directly. And I remember all of the like guys in uniform like turning. <laughs> Does she know you? <laughs> and I didn't say anything. It, we're all just stunned. And she she goes, "Hey you!" Like I was like, "Oh no, now we're friends." <laughs> and I'm like, "What the fuck is going on? What is going on?" And she goes, "Girl, don't I know you from AA?" <laughs> <laughs> and I just. You know, like naive twenty something me wanted to freaking die. Cause all the all these, you know, like hot firefighters and police are just yeah. like <laughs> And I'm there like, no no no, no, I that's I mean that's great, but I you know, 
I passed my new hire drug test. Like, please don't judge me. <laughs> I am more worried about what everybody else is I was, thinking. Well, yes, because yes, I was so young and so naive. And you know how that, that hierarchy in the medical system. So I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God. Like, I just started, and this is the reputation I'm going to get. <laughs> And it was it was just so funny because she thought we were friends. And, um, you know, there's been two people in my life that can call me Jesse and not make my skin crawl. You know, it's just a nickname yeah. I don't love. <laughs> and one is my grandmother. And one was her. <laughs> she made it, huh? She was like, Nurse Jesse. And, man, whatever she thought, we were buds. And... For several years, she would come in, and if I was there, it was cool. She, you know, she'd settle down. Well, that's good. <laughs> if Sounds not, like you made a good friend that yeah, day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But so that was that was embarrassing. I mean, in hindsight, I was like, what was I worried about? Patients yeah. say crazy things all the time. <laughs> all but the just time. being so new and naive, I was I was horrified. Well, clearly, if that was that long ago, and you can still <laughs> yeah yeah, um, and. <laughs> the second, the other one that was, I think is pretty funny was um, my first flight. So I was, I was with another one of the, the helicopter bases. And since I was new and, the, you know, it was cool enough that we could carry the weight of four people. So they ran with a normal crew who knew what they were doing and then let me tag along, right? And it was, it was just epic. It was one of those... Just felt like it was out of a movie. We got, it was a scene call. This guy had been electrocuted working on like a gas station sign. And it was my first experience with Mm pre-hospital, right? That was the whole landing in the dirt parking lot and having that moment of what, what do we do, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we got him loaded up and, um, you know, I got to start an IV like in flight and, and, took him to the trauma center and dropped him off and and just was just I this is wonderful I this is the best job ever I love this so and then we were flying back to base and on the flight back because I'd sat in the back part of the, the aircraft there and with the patient so on the flight back one of the crew was like hey Jess why don't you sit sit in the front on the flight back and you know you do have responsibilities. Keep an eye out for, for traffic. You've got a better viewpoint than when you're in the back of the helicopter. And everything the set's set up is like where you plug your your headset in is a little different. And so they gave me a quick rundown and I, you know, you know, got in the front and we took off from the, the roof of the trauma center, you know, into the sunset. So we're still in um, the major city's airspace. And, you know, at that time, you don't really want to talk over the radio unless you absolutely have to yeah but we were getting towards the like the north end of that boundary and the pilot came over the radio and was like well Jess what do you think and I keyed up what I thought was just the radio in the helicopter and said something along the lines of that was fucking amazing I'm in love (laughs) and then the pilot like dropped his head and like I remember looking back and the crew in the back is just bent over dying, dying. and then right about that time it was like major airport tower to CF 916 this uh I think you have a hot mic <laughs> so, I professed my love of flight nursing to the world the world <laughs> Dropped an f bomb and professed my love of flight nursing to all of Albuquerque airspace. <laughs> That's a little... <laughs> I think if you've been in this long enough, you've at least done one hot mic, and mine was very early, very early in my career as a volunteer firefighter. And I was sitting in the back of a truck, and we were working some huge event. <laughs> it was a big event, <laughs> and uh, the two guys up front were just messing around. I don't even know what they were saying, but I was like. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> You're so fucking dumb. And like texts start coming up on my phone, on the other two guys' phones. And I'm probably one of the only females working this event. Right. In the capacity so that I was everyone at. Knew yeah, so it was everybody you. was like, oh, that was Sam. Oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> Tell Sam she's hot. <laughs> Warn her before she says any more. <laughs> right. It's nothing. Yeah. 
it's oh, it's never anything like semi appropriate oh, no, that you get a hot mic on, yeah, right? No, it never will be. <laughs> <laughs> if you're new, it never will be. Right. <laughs> um, that's awesome. So to kind of end on a good note, what advice would you give your younger self coming into the field? Um, my younger self, I wish I knew just the importance of being proactive with self care. Like you, you don't have to wait until that starts to build up and come out in other ways. Also not to underestimate that just because you might feel okay the next day, that it's that it's something that you've processed or that it, it's not something that will not show up later on. I don't know, my younger self, I, I was so, I, I kind of knew it at the time, but that I was, I was very thankful for the experience of the nurses, the medics um, of the hospital I worked at. But um, yeah, I'm so thankful because having just a strong group around you just really helps you become the provider, you know, the nurse, the medic you're going to be. And I wish I, my younger self knew to thank those people a little bit more. So for all you fools listening, (laughs) thank you. Yes. (laughs) Having a good team to support you is very underrated. I think I think a lot of people don't realize it until they're out of it that they're like, totally fuck, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's everything. And uh, yeah, in kind of where the state of hospital work is now, I mean, I, I have even more appreciation because I don't think I would have been able to do the cool stuff I have done if I wasn't, if I was trained in a different way, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for joining me on the yes, podcast today. You. It was a great conversation. I had a blast. It was fun. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Before we wrap up, we have a few important announcements to share with you. Firstly, we're excited to announce the launch of our brand new 911 Nonsense Facebook group page. It's a community where everyone can go to connect, share ideas, discuss topics from the show, and get all of the most recent updates about the podcast. We'd love to have you join us and be part of the conversation. Next, we want to ask you to rate and review our podcast on your preferred platform. Your feedback means the world to us and helps us reach a wider audience. By rating and reviewing the show, you'll be supporting us in a big way and helping others discover 911 nonsense. If you enjoy what we do and would like to support the podcast even further, we have a few options available. You can visit samspursuit.com to find the links to our 911 nonsense merch page and our recently released noon gear page. Every contribution, no matter the size, goes a long way in helping us continue to better the podcast. We know that not everyone is comfortable being on the podcast, but we still want to hear your stories and experiences. If you have a compelling story and would like to share it to be read by me in a future episode, please reach out to us via email at 911nonsense at gmail.com or through our website's contact section. If you choose to be anonymous, we'll make sure to respect your privacy while sharing your story in a way that resonates with our audience. Thank you again for tuning in. We truly appreciate your support and look forward to bringing you more engaging content in the future. See you next week.